Chapter sixteen of Biographia Literaria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Chapter sixteen. Striking points of difference between the poets of the present age and those of the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries. Wish expressed for the union of the characteristic merits of both. Christendom, from its first settlement on feudal rights, has been so far one great body, however perfectly organised, that a similar spirit will be found in each period to have been acting in all its members. The study of Shakespeare's poems, I do not include his dramatic works, eminently as they too deserve that title, led me to a more careful examination of the contemporary poets both in England and in other countries. But my attention was especially fixed on those of Italy, from the birth to the death of Shakespeare, that being the country in which the fine arts had been most sedulously and hitherto most successfully cultivated. Abstracted from the degrees and peculiarities of individual genius, the properties common to the good writers of each period seem to establish one striking point of difference between the poetry of the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries and that of the present age. The remark may perhaps be extended to the sister art of painting. At least the latter will serve to illustrate the former. In the present age the poet, I would wish to be understood as speaking generally, and without allusion to individual names, seems to propose to himself as his main object, and as that which is the most characteristic of his art, new and striking images, with incidents that interest the affections, or excite the curiosity, both his characters, and his descriptions he renders, as much as possible, specific and individual, even to a degree of portraiture. In his diction and metre, on the other hand, he is comparatively careless. The measure is either constructed on no previous system, and acknowledges no justifying principle but that of the writer's convenience, or else some mechanical movement is adopted, of which one couplet or stanza is so far an adequate specimen, as that the occasional differences appear evidently to arise from accident, or the qualities of the language itself, not from meditation and an intelligent purpose and the language from Pope's translation of Homer to Darwin's Temple of Nature may, notwithstanding some illustrious exceptions, be too faithfully characterised as claiming to be poetical for no better reason than that it would be intolerable in conversation or in prose, though, alas, even our prose writings, nay, even the style of our more set discourses, strive to be in the fashion, and trick themselves out in the soiled and overworn finery of the meretricious muse. It is true that of late a great improvement in this respect is observable in our most popular writers, but it is equally true that this recurrence to plain sense and genuine mother English is far from being general, and that the composition of our novels, magazines, public harangues, and the like is commonly as trivial in thought, and yet enigmatic in expression, as if Echo and Sphinx had laid their heads together to construct it. Nay, even of those who have most rescued themselves from this contagion, I should plead inwardly guilty to the charge of duplicity or cowardice if I withheld my conviction that few have guarded the purity of their native tongue with that jealous care which the sublime Dante, in his tract De la Volgare Eloquenza, declares to be the first duty of a poet. For language is the armoury of the human mind, and at once contains the trophies of its past and the weapons of its future conquests. Animadvertes, says Hobbes, quam sit ab improprietate verborum pronum hominibus, pro labi in errore circa ipsas res sat vero says senatus in hac vitae brevitate et naturae obscuritate rerum est quibus cognoscendis tempus impendato ut confusis et multivotis sermonibus intelligendis illud consumere opus non sit e hu quanta strages paraveri verba nubila quae tot dicunt ut nihil dicunt nobis potius e quibus et in rebus politicis et in ecclesia turbines et toni trua erumpunt et pro inde recte dictum putamus a platone in gorgia os an ta onomata edei et setai kai ta pragmata et ab epicteto archai paedusios hai ton onomaton episcepsis et prudentissime galeno scribit hai ton onomaton crasis tarecthesia kai tain ton pragmaton apitaratae gnosin egrige vero j c scaliger in liber one de plantis as primum inquit sapientis officium bene sentire ut sibi vivat proximum bene loqui ut patriae vivat as something analogous to the materials and structure of modern poetry i seem to have noticed 
but here I beg to be understood as speaking with the utmost diffidence, in our common landscape painters. Their foregrounds and intermediate distances are comparatively unattractive, while the main interest of the landscape is thrown into the background, where mountains and torrents and castles forbid the eye to proceed, and nothing tempts it to trace its way back again. But in the works of the great Italian and Flemish masters, the front and middle objects of the landscape are the most obvious and determinate, the interest gradually dies away in the background, and the charm and peculiar worth of the picture consists not so much in the specific objects, which it conveys to the understanding in a visual language formed by the substitution of figures for words, as in the beauty and harmony of the colours, lines, and expression with which the objects are represented. Hence novelty of subject was rather avoided than sought for. Superior excellence in the manner of treating the same subjects was the trial and test of the artist's merit. Not otherwise is it with the more polished poets of the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries, especially those of Italy. The imagery is almost always general. Sun, moon, flowers, breezes, murmuring streams, warbling songsters, delicious shades, lovely damsels, cruel as fair, nymphs, naiads, and goddesses, are the materials which are common to all, and which each shaped and arranged according to his judgment or fancy, little solicitous to add or to particularise. If we make an honourable exception in favour of some English poets, the thoughts, too, are as little novel as the images, and the fable of their narrative poems, for the most part drawn from mythology or sources of equal notoriety, derive their chief attractions from the manner of treating them, from impassioned flow or picturesque arrangement. In opposition to the present age, and perhaps in as faulty an extreme, they place the essence of poetry in the art. The excellence at which they aimed consisted in the exquisite polish of the diction, combined with perfect simplicity. This their prime object they attained by the avoidance of every word, which a gentleman would not use in dignified conversation, and of every word and phrase, which none but a learned man would use, by the studied position of words and phrases, so that not only each part should be melodious in itself, but contribute to the harmony of the whole, each note referring and conducting to the melody of all the foregoing and following words of the same period or stanza, and lastly, with equal labour, the greater because unbetrayed, by the variation and various harmonies of their metrical movement. Their measures, however, were not indebted for their variety to the introduction of new metres, such as have been attempted of late in the Alonso and Imogen, and others borrowed from the German, having in their very mechanism a specific overpowering tune, to which the generous reader humours his voice and emphasis, with more indulgence to the author than attention to the meaning or quantity of the words, but which, to an ear familiar with the numerous sounds of the Greek and Roman poets, has an effect not unlike that of galloping over a paved road in a German stage-wagon without springs. On the contrary, the elder bards both of Italy and England produced a far greater as well as more charming variety by countless modifications and subtle balances of sound in the common metres of their country. A lasting and enviable reputation awaits that man of genius who should attempt and realise a union, who should recall the high finish, the appropriateness, the facility, the delicate proportion, and above all the perfusive and omnipresent grace, which have preserved, as in a shrine of precious amber, the spire of Catullus, the swallow, the grasshopper, and all the other little loves of Anacreon, and which with bright though diminished glories, revisited the youth and early manhood of Christian Europe, in the vales of Arno, and the groves of Isis and of Cam, and who with these should combine the keener interest, deeper pathos, manlier reflection, and the fresher and more various imagery, which give a value and a name that will not pass away, to the poets who have done honour to our own times, and to those of our immediate predecessors. End of chapter 16. Chapter 17 of Biographia Literaria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Chapter 17. Examination of the tenets peculiar to Mr. Wordsworth rustic life above all low and rustic life especially unfavourable to the formation of a human diction the best parts of language the product of philosophers not of clowns or shepherds poetry essentially ideal and generic the language of milton as much the language of real life yea incomparably more so than that of the cottager as far then as mr wordsworth in his preface contended and most ably contended for a reformation in our poetic diction as far as he has evinced the truth of passion 
and the dramatic propriety of those figures and metaphors in the original poets which stripped of their justifying reasons and converted into mere artifices of connection or ornament constitute the characteristic falsity in the poetic style of the moderns and as far as he has with equal acuteness and clearness pointed out the process by which this change was effected and the resemblances between that state into which the reader's mind is thrown by the pleasurable confusion of thought from an unaccustomed train of words and images and that state which is induced by the natural language of impassioned feeling he undertook a useful task and deserves all praise both for the attempt and for the execution the provocations to this remonstrance in behalf of truth and nature were still of perpetual recurrence before and after the publication of this preface i cannot likewise but add that the comparison of such poems of merit as have been given to the public within the last ten or twelve years with the majority of those produced previously to the appearance of that preface leave no doubt on my mind that mr wordsworth is fully justified in believing his efforts to have been by no means ineffectual not only in the verses of those who have professed their admiration of his genius but even of those who have distinguished themselves by hostility to his theory and depreciation of his writings are the impressions of his principles plainly visible it is possible that with these principles others may have been blended which are not equally evident and some which are unsteady and subvertible from the narrowness or imperfection of their basis but it is more than possible that these errors of defect or exaggeration by kindling and feeding the controversy may have conduced not only to the wider propagation of the accompanying truths but that by their frequent presentation to the mind in an excited state they may have won for them a more permanent and practical result a man will borrow apart from his opponent the more easily if he feels himself justified in continuing to reject a part while there remain important points in which he can still feel himself in the right in which he still finds firm footing for continued resistance he will gradually adopt those opinions which were the least remote from his own convictions as not less congruous with his own theory than with that which he reprobates in like manner with a kind of instinctive prudence he will abandon by little and little his weakest posts till at length he seems to forget that they had ever belonged to him or affects to consider them at most as accidental and petty annexments the removal of which leaves the citadel unhurt and unendangered my own differences from certain supposed parts of mr wordsworth's theory ground themselves on the assumption that his words had been rightly interpreted as purporting that the proper diction for poetry in general consists altogether in a language taken with due exceptions from the mouths of men in real life a language which actually constitutes the natural conversation of men under the influence of natural feelings my objection is first that in any sense this rule is applicable only to certain classes of poetry secondly that even to these classes it is not applicable except in such a sense as hath never by any one as far as i know or have read been denied or doubted and lastly that as far as and in that degree in which it is practicable it is yet as a rule useless if not injurious and therefore either need not or ought not to be practised the poet informs his reader that he had generally chosen low and rustic life but not as low and rustic or in order to repeat that pleasure of doubtful moral effect which persons of elevated rank and of superior refinement oftentimes derive from a happy imitation of the rude unpolished manners and discourse of their inferiors for the pleasure so derived may be traced to three exciting causes the first is the naturalness in fact of the things represented the second is the apparent naturalness of the representation as raised and qualified by an imperceptible infusion of the author's own knowledge and talent which infusion does indeed constitute it an imitation as distinguished from a mere copy the third cause may be found in the reader's conscious feeling of his superiority awakened by the contrast presented to him even as for the same purpose the kings and great barons of yore retained sometimes actual clowns and fools but more frequently shrewd and witty fellows in that character these however were not mr wordsworth's objects he chose low and rustic life because in that condition the essential passions of the heart find a better soil in which they can attain their maturity are less under restraint and speak a plainer and more emphatic language because in that condition of life our elementary feelings coexist in a state of greater simplicity and consequently may be more accurately contemplated and more forcibly communicated because the manners of rural life germinate from those elementary feelings and from the necessary character of rural occupations are more easily comprehended and are more durable and lastly because in that condition the passions of men are incorporated with the beautiful and permanent forms of nature 
now it is clear to me that in the most interesting of the poems in which the author is more or less dramatic as the brothers michael ruth the mad mother and others the persons introduced are by no means taken from low or rustic life in the common acceptation of those words and it is not less clear that the sentiments and language as far as they can be conceived to have been really transferred from the minds and conversation of such persons are attributable to causes and circumstances not necessarily connected with their occupations and abode the thoughts feelings language and manners of the shepherd farmers in the vales of cumberland and westmoreland as far as they are actually adopted in those poems may be accounted for from causes which will and do produce the same results in every state of life whether in town or country as the two principal i rank that independence which raises a man above servitude or daily toil for the profit of others yet not above the necessity of industry and a frugal simplicity of domestic life and the accompanying unambitious but solid and religious education which has rendered few books familiar but the bible and the liturgy or hymn-book to this latter cause indeed which is so far accidental that it is the blessing of particular countries and a particular age not the product of particular places or employments the poet owes the show of probability that his personages might really feel think and talk with any tolerable resemblance to his representation it is an excellent remark of dr henry moore's that a man of confined education but of good parts by constant reading of the bible will naturally form a more winning and commanding rhetoric than those that are learned the intermixture of tongues and of artificial phrases debasing their style it is moreover to be considered that to the formation of healthy feelings and a reflecting mind negations involve impediments not less formidable than sophistication and vicious intermixture i am convinced that for the human soul to prosper in rustic life a certain vantage ground is prerequisite it is not every man that is likely to be improved by a country life or by country labours education or original sensibility or both must pre-exist if the changes forms and incidents of nature are to prove a sufficient stimulant and where these are not sufficient the mind contracts and hardens by want of stimulants and the man becomes selfish sensual gross and hard-hearted let the management of the poor laws in liverpool manchester or bristol be compared with the ordinary dispensation of the poor rates in agricultural villages where the farmers are the overseers and guardians of the poor if my own experience have not been particularly unfortunate as well as that of the many respectable country clergymen with whom i have conversed on the subject the result would engender more than scepticism concerning the desirable influences of low and rustic life in and for itself whatever may be concluded on the other side from the stronger local attachments and enterprising spirit of the swiss and other mountaineers applies to a particular mode of pastoral life under forms of property that permit and beget manners truly republican not to rustic life in general or to the absence of artificial cultivation on the contrary the mountaineers whose manners have been so often eulogized are in general better educated and greater readers than men of equal rank elsewhere but where this is not the case as among the peasantry of north wales the ancient mountains with all their terrors and all their glories are pictures to the blind and music to the deaf i should not have entered so much into detail upon this passage but here seems to be the point to which all the lines of difference converge as to their source and centre i mean as far as and in whatever respect my poetic creed does differ from the doctrines promulgated in this preface i adopt with full faith the principle of aristotle that poetry as poetry is essentially ideal that it avoids and excludes all accident that its apparent individualities of rank character or occupation must be representative of a class and that the persons of poetry must be clothed with generic attributes with the common attributes of the class not with such as one gifted individual might possibly possess but such as from his situation it is most probable beforehand that he would possess if my premises are right and my deductions legitimate it follows that there can be no poetic medium between the swains of theocritus and those of an imaginary golden age the characters of the vicar and the shepherd mariner in the poem of the brothers and that of the shepherd of greenhead gill in the michael have all the verisimilitude and representative quality that the purposes of poetry can require they are persons of a known and abiding class and their manners and sentiments the natural product of circumstances common to the class take michael for instance an old man stout of heart and strong of limb his bodily frame had been from youth to age of an unusual strength his mind was keen intense and frugal apt for all affairs and in his shepherd's calling he was prompt and watchful more than ordinary men hence he had learned the meaning of all winds of blasts of every tone and oftentimes when others heeded not he heard the south make subterraneous music 
like the noise of bagpipers on distant highland hills the shepherd at such warning of his flock bethought him and he to himself would say the winds are now devising work for me and truly at all times the storm that drives the traveller to a shelter summoned him up to the mountains he had been alone amid the heart of many thousand mists that came to him and left him on the heights so lived he until his eightieth year was past and grossly that man errs who should suppose that the green valleys and the streams and rocks were things indifferent to the shepherd's thoughts fields where with cheerful spirits he had breathed the common air the hills which he so oft had climbed with vigorous steps which had impressed so many incidents upon his mind of hardship skill or courage joy or fear which like a book preserved the memory of the dumb animals whom he had saved had fed or sheltered linking to such acts so grateful in themselves the certainty of honourable gain these fields these hills which were his living being even more than his own blood what could they less had laid strong hold on his affections were to him a pleasurable feeling of blind love the pleasure which there is in life itself on the other hand in the poems which are pitched in a lower key as the harry gill and the idiot boy the feelings are those of human nature in general though the poet has judiciously laid the scene in the country in order to place himself in the vicinity of interesting images without the necessity of ascribing a sentimental perception of their beauty to the persons of his drama in the idiot boy indeed the mother's character is not so much the real and native product of a situation where the essential passions of the heart find a better soil in which they can attain their maturity and speak a plainer and more emphatic language as it is an impersonation of an instinct abandoned by judgment hence the two following charges seem to me not wholly groundless at least they are the only plausible objections which i have heard to that fine poem the one is that the author has not in the poem itself taken sufficient care to preclude from the reader's fancy the disgusting images of ordinary morbid idiocy which yet it was by no means his intention to represent he was even by the 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 uncounteracted by any preceding description of the boy's beauty assisted in recalling them the other is that the idiocy of the boy is so evenly balanced by the folly of the mother as to present to the general reader rather a laughable burlesque on the blindness of anile dotage than an analytic display of maternal affection in its ordinary workings in the thorn the poet himself acknowledges in a note the necessity of an introductory poem in which he should have portrayed the character of the person from whom the words of the poem are supposed to proceed a superstitious man moderately imaginative of slow faculties and deep feelings a captain of a small trading vessel for example who being past the middle age of life had retired upon an annuity or small independent income to some village or country town of which he was not a native or in which he had not been accustomed to live such men having nothing to do become credulous and talkative from indolence but in a poem still more in a lyric poem and the nurse in romeo and juliet alone prevents me from extending the remark even to dramatic poetry if indeed even the nurse can be deemed altogether a case in point it is not possible to imitate truly a dull and garrulous discourser without repeating the effects of dullness and garrulity however this may be i dare assert that the parts and these form the far larger portion of the whole which might as well or still better have proceeded from the poet's own imagination and have been spoken in his own character are those which have given and which will continue to give universal delight and that the passage is exclusively appropriate to the supposed narrator such as the last couplet of the third stanza the seven last lines of the tenth and the five following stanzas with the exception of the four admirable lines at the commencement of the fourteenth are felt by many unprejudiced and unsophisticated hearts as sudden and unpleasant sinkings from the height to which the poet had previously lifted them and to which he again re-elevates both himself and his reader if then i am compelled to doubt the theory by which the choice of characters was to be directed not only a priori from grounds of reason but both from the few instances in which the poet himself need be supposed to have been governed by it and from the comparative inferiority of those instances still more must i hesitate in my assent to the sentence which immediately follows the former citation and which i can neither admit as particular fact nor as general rule the language too of these men has been adopted purified indeed from what appear to be its real defects from all lasting and rational causes of dislike or disgust because such men hourly communicate with the best objects from which the best part of language is originally derived and because from their rank in society and the sameness and narrow circle of their intercourse being less under the action of social vanity they convey their feelings and notions in simple and unelaborated expressions to this i reply that a rustic's language purified from all provincialism and grossness 
and so far reconstructed as to be made consistent with the rules of grammar which are in essence no other than the laws of universal logic applied to psychological materials will not differ from the language of any other man of common sense however learned or refined he may be except as far as the notions which the rustic has to convey are fewer and more indiscriminate this will become still clearer if we add the consideration equally important though less obvious that the rustic from the more imperfect development of his faculties and from the lower state of their cultivation aims almost solely to convey insulated facts either those of his scanty experience or his traditional belief while the educated man chiefly seeks to discover and express those connections of things or those relative bearings of fact to fact from which some more or less general law is deducible for facts are valuable to a wise man chiefly as they lead to the discovery of the indwelling law which is the true being of things the sole solution of their modes of existence and in the knowledge of which consists our dignity and our power as little can i agree with the assertion that from the objects with which the rustic hourly communicates the best part of language is formed for first if to communicate with an object implies such an acquaintance with it as renders it capable of being discriminately reflected on the distinct knowledge of an uneducated rustic would furnish a very scanty vocabulary the few things and modes of action requisite for his bodily conveniences would alone be individualized while all the rest of nature would be expressed by a small number of confused general terms secondly i deny that the words and combinations of words derived from the objects with which the rustic is familiar whether with distinct or confused knowledge can be justly said to form the best part of language it is more than probable that many classes of the brute creation possess discriminating sounds by which they can convey to each other notices of such objects as concern their food shelter or safety yet we hesitate to call the aggregate of such sounds a language otherwise than metaphorically the best part of human language properly so called is derived from reflection on the acts of the mind itself it is formed by a voluntary appropriation of fixed symbols to internal acts to processes and results of imagination the greater part of which have no place in the consciousness of uneducated man though in civilized society by imitation and passive remembrance of what they hear from their religious instructors and other superiors the most uneducated share in the harvest which they neither sowed nor reaped if the history of the phrases in hourly currency among our peasants were traced a person not previously aware of the fact would be surprised at finding so large a number which three or four centuries ago were the exclusive property of the universities and the schools and at the commencement of the reformation had been transferred from the school to the pulpit and thus gradually passed into common life the extreme difficulty and often the impossibility of finding words for the simplest moral and intellectual processes of the languages of uncivilized tribes has proved perhaps the weightiest obstacle to the progress of our most zealous and adroit missionaries yet these tribes are surrounded by the same nature as our peasants are but in still more impressive forms and they are moreover obliged to particularize many more of them when therefore mr wordsworth adds accordingly such a language meaning as before the language of rustic life purified from provincialism arising out of repeated experience and regular feelings is a more permanent and a far more philosophical language than that which is frequently substituted for it by poets who think that they are conferring honour upon themselves and their art in proportion as they indulge in arbitrary and capricious habits of expression it may be answered that the language which he has in view can be attributed to rustics with no greater right than the style of hooker or bacon to tom brown or sir roger lestrange doubtless if what is peculiar to each were omitted in each the result must needs be the same further that the poet who uses an illogical diction or a style fitted to excite only the low and changeable pleasure of wonder by means of groundless novelty substitutes a language of folly and vanity not for that of the rustic but for that of good sense and natural feeling here let me be permitted to remind the reader that the positions which i controvert are contained in the sentences a selection of the real language of men the language of these men and that is men in low and rustic life has been adopted i have proposed to myself to imitate and as far as is possible to adopt the very language of men between the language of prose and that of metrical composition there neither is nor can be any essential difference it is against these exclusively that my opposition is directed i object in the very first instance to an equivocation in the use of the word real every man's language varies according to the extent of his knowledge the activity of his faculties and the depth or quickness of his feelings every man's language has first its individualities secondly the common properties of the class to which he belongs and thirdly words and phrases of universal use the language of hooker bacon bishop taylor and burke differs from the common language of the learned class 
only by the superior number and novelty of the thoughts and relations which they had to convey. The language of Algernon and Sidney differs not at all from that which every well-educated gentleman would wish to write, and, with due allowances for the undeliberateness and less connected train, of thinking natural and proper to conversation, such as he would wish to talk. Neither one nor the other differ half as much from the general language of cultivated society, as the language of Mr. Wordsworth's homeliest composition differs from that of a common peasant. For real, therefore, we must substitute ordinary or lingua communis, and this, we have proved, is no more to be found in the phraseology of low and rustic life than in that of any other class. Omit the peculiarities of each, and the result, of course, must be common to all. And assuredly the omissions and changes to be made in the language of rustics, before it could be transferred to any species of poem, except the drama or other professed imitation, are at least as numerous and weighty as would be required in adapting to the same purpose the ordinary language of tradesmen and manufacturers. Not to mention that the language so highly extolled by Mr. Wordsworth varies in every county, nay, in every village, according to the accidental character of the clergyman, the existence or non-existence of schools, or even, perhaps, as the excitement, publican and barber happen to be, or not to be, zealous politicians and readers of the weekly newspaper pro bono publico. Anterior to cultivation, the lingua communis of every country, as Dante has well observed, exists everywhere in parts, and nowhere as a whole. Neither is the case rendered at all more tenable by the addition of the words in a state of excitement, for the nature of a man's words, where he is strongly affected by joy, grief, or anger, must necessarily depend on the number and quality of the general truths, conceptions, and images, and of the words expressing them, with which his mind had been previously stored. For the property of passion is not to create, but to set in increased activity, at least whatever new connections of thoughts or images, or, which is equally, if not more than equally, the appropriate effect of strong excitement, whatever generalizations of truth or experience the heat of passion may produce, yet the terms of their conveyance must have pre-existed in his former conversations, and are only collected and crowded together by the unusual stimulation. It is indeed very possible to adopt in a poem the unmeaning repetitions, habitual phrases, and other blank counters, which an unfurnished or confused understanding interposes at short intervals, in order to keep hold of his subject, which is still slipping from him, and to give him time for recollection, or, in mere aid of vacancy, as in the scanty companies of a country stage, the same player pops backwards and forwards, in order to prevent the appearance of empty spaces, in the procession of Macbeth or Henry the Eighth. But what assistance to the poet, or ornament to the poem, these can supply, I am at a loss to conjecture. Nothing assuredly can differ either in origin or in mode more widely from the apparent tautologies of intense and turbulent feeling, in which the passion is greater and of longer endurance, than to be exhausted or satisfied by a single representation of the image, or incident exciting it. Such repetitions I admit to be a beauty of the highest kind, as illustrated by Mr. Wordsworth himself from the Song of Deborah. At her feet he bowed, he fell, he lay down. At her feet he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed, there he fell down dead. Judges, verse 27. End of chapter 17. Chapter 18 of Biographia Literaria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Chapter 18. Language of metrical composition, why and wherein essentially different from that of prose, origin and elements of metre, its necessary consequences, and the conditions thereby imposed on the metrical writer in the choice of his diction. I conclude, therefore, that the attempt is impracticable, and that, were it not impracticable, it would still be useless. For the very power of making the selection implies the previous possession of the language selected. Or where can the poet have lived? And by what rules could he direct his choice, which would not have enabled him to select and arrange his words by the light of his own judgment? We do not adopt the language of a class by the mere adoption of such words exclusively as that class would use, or at least understand, but likewise by following the order in which the words of such men are wont to succeed each other. Now this order in the intercourse of uneducated men is distinguished from the diction of their superiors in knowledge and power by the greater disjunction and separation in the component parts of that, whatever it be, which they wish to communicate. There is a want of that prospectiveness of mind, that serve you which enables a man to foresee the whole of what he is to convey, appertaining to any one point, 
and by this means so to subordinate and arrange the different parts according to their relative importance as to convey it at once and as an organized whole now i will take the first stanza on which i have chanced to open in the lyrical ballads it is one the most simple and the least peculiar in its language in distant countries have i been and yet i have not often seen a healthy man a man full grown weep in the public roads alone but such a one on english ground and in the broad highway i met along the broad highway he came his cheeks with tears were wet sturdy he seemed though he was sad and in his arms a lamb he had the words here are doubtless such as are current in all ranks of life and of course not less so in the hamlet and cottage than in the shop manufactory college or palace but is this the order in which the rustic would have placed the words i am grievously deceived if the following less compact mode of commencing the same tale be not a far more faithful copy i have been in a many parts far and near and i don't know that i ever saw before a man crying by himself in the public road a grown man i mean that was neither sick nor hurt etc etc but when i turn to the following stanza in the thorn at all times of the day and night this wretched woman thither goes and she is known to every star and every wind that blows and there beside the thorn she sits when the blue daylight's in the skies and when the whirlwind's on the hill or frosty air is keen and still and to herself she cries o misery o misery o woe is me o misery and compare this with the language of ordinary men or with that which i can conceive at all likely to proceed in real life from such a narrator as is supposed in the note to the poem compare it either in the succession of the images or of the sentences i am reminded of the sublime prayer and hymn of praise which milton in opposition to an established liturgy presents as a fair specimen of common extemporary devotion and such as we might expect to hear from every self-inspired minister of a conventicle and i reflect with delight how little a mere theory though of his own workmanship interferes with the processes of genuine imagination in a man of true poetic genius who possesses as mr wordsworth if ever man did most assuredly does possess the vision and the faculty divine one point then alone remains but that the most important its examination having been indeed my chief inducement for the preceding inquisition there neither is nor can be any essential difference between the language of prose and metrical composition such is mr wordsworth's assertion now prose itself at least in all argumentative and consecutive works differs and ought to differ from the language of conversation even as reading ought to differ from talking unless therefore the difference denied be that of the mere words as materials common to all styles of writing and not of the style itself in the universally admitted sense of the term it might be naturally presumed that there must exist a still greater between the ordinance of poetic composition and that of prose than is expected to distinguish prose from ordinary conversation there are not indeed examples wanting in the history of literature of apparent paradoxes that have summoned the public wonder as new and startling truths but which on examination have shrunk into tame and harmless truisms as the eyes of a cat seen in the dark have been mistaken for flames of fire but mr wordsworth is among the last men to whom a delusion of this kind would be attributed by any one who had enjoyed the slightest opportunity of understanding his mind and character where an objection has been anticipated by such an author as natural his answer to it must needs be interpreted in some sense which either is or has been or is capable of being controverted my object then must be to discover some other meaning for the term essential difference in this place exclusive of the indistinction and community of the words themselves for whether there ought to exist a class of words in the english in any degree resembling the poetic dialect of the greek and italian is a question of very subordinate importance the number of such words would be small indeed in our language and even in the italian and greek they consist not so much of different words as of slight differences in the forms of declining and conjugating the same words forms doubtless which having been at some period more or less remote the common grammatic flexions of some tribe or province had been accidentally appropriated to poetry by the general admiration of certain master intellects the first established lights of inspiration to whom that dialect happened to be native essence in its primary signification means the principle of individuation the inmost principle of the possibility of anything as that particular thing it is equivalent to the idea of a thing whenever we use the word idea with philosophic precision existence on the other hand is distinguished from essence by the superinduction of reality thus we speak of the essence and essential properties of a circle but we do not therefore assert that anything which really exists is mathematically circular thus too without any tautology we contend for the existence of the supreme being that is for a reality correspondent to the idea 
there is next a secondary use of the word essence in which it signifies the point or ground of contradistinction between two modifications of the same substance or subject thus we should be allowed to say that the style of architecture of westminster abbey is essentially different from that of st paul even though both had been built with blocks cut into the same form and from the same quarry only in this latter sense of the term must it have been denied by mr wordsworth for in this sense alone is it affirmed by the general opinion that the language of poetry that is the formal construction or architecture of the words and phrases is essentially different from that of prose now the burden of the proof lies with the oppugner not with the supporters of the common belief mr wordsworth in consequence assigns as the proof of his position that not only the language of a large portion of every good poem even of the most elevated character must necessarily except with reference to the metre in no respect differ from that of good prose but likewise that some of the most interesting parts of the best poems will be found to be strictly the language of prose when prose is well written the truth of this assertion might be demonstrated by innumerable passages from almost all the poetical writings even of milton himself he then quotes gray's sonnet in vain to me the smiling morning shine and reddening phoebus lifts his golden fire the birds in vain their amorous descant join or cheerful fields resume their green attire these ears alas for other notes repine a different object do these eyes require my lonely anguish melts no heart but mine and in my breast the imperfect joys expire yet morning smiles the busy race to cheer and new-born pleasure brings to happier men the fields to all their wonted tribute bear to warm their little loves the birds complain i fruitless mourn to him that cannot hear and weep the more because i weep in vain and adds the following remark it will easily be perceived that the only part of this sonnet which is of any value is the lines printed in italics it is equally obvious that except in the rhyme and in the use of the single word fruitless for fruitlessly which is so far a defect the language of these lines does in no respect differ from that of prose an idealist defending his system by the fact that when asleep we often believe ourselves awake was well answered by his plain neighbour ah but when awake do we ever believe ourselves asleep things identical must be convertible the preceding passage seems to rest on a similar sophism for the question is not whether there may not occur in prose an order of words which would be equally proper in a poem nor whether there are not beautiful lines and sentences of frequent occurrence in good poems which would be equally becoming as well as beautiful in good prose for neither the one nor the other has ever been either denied or doubted by any one the true question must be whether there are not modes of expression a construction and an order of sentences which are in their fit and natural place in a serious prose composition but would be disproportionate and heterogeneous in metrical poetry and vice versa whether in the language of a serious poem there may not be an arrangement both of words and sentences and a use and selection of what are called figures of speech both as to their kind their frequency and their occasions which on a subject of equal weight would be vicious and alien in correct and manly prose i contend that in both cases this unfitness of each for the place of the other frequently will and ought to exist and first from the origin of metre this i would trace to the balance in the mind effected by that spontaneous effort which strives to hold in check the workings of passion it might be easily explained likewise in what manner this salutary antagonism is assisted by the very state which it counteracts and how this balance of antagonists became organized into metre in the usual acceptation of that term by a supervening act of the will and judgment consciously and for the foreseen purpose of pleasure assuming these principles as the data of our argument we deduce from them two legitimate conditions which the critic is entitled to expect in every metrical work first that as the elements of metre owe their existence to a state of increased excitement so the metre itself should be accompanied by the natural language of excitement secondly that as these elements are formed into metre artificially by a voluntary act with the design and for the purpose of blending delight with emotion so the traces of present volition should throughout the metrical language be proportionately discernible now these two conditions must be reconciled and co-present there must be not only a partnership but a union an interpenetration of passion and of will of spontaneous impulse and of voluntary purpose again this union can be manifested only in a frequency of forms and figures of speech originally the offspring of passion but now the adopted children of power greater than would be desired or endured where the emotion is not voluntarily encouraged and kept up for the sake of that pleasure which such emotion so tempered and mastered by the will is found capable of communicating it not only dictates but of itself tends to produce a more frequent employment of picturesque and vivifying language than would be natural in any other case in which there did not exist as there does in the present a previous and well understood though tacit compact between the poet and his reader that the latter is entitled to expect 
and the former bound to supply this species and degree of pleasurable excitement, we may in some measure apply to this union the answer of Polixenes in the winter's tale, to Perdita's neglect of the street gilliflowers, because she had heard it said, There is an art which in their piedness shares with great creating nature. Polixenes, say there be. Yet nature is made better by no mean, but nature makes that mean. So o'er oh, that art, which you say adds to nature, is an art that nature makes. You see, sweet maid, we marry a gentler scion to the wildest stock, and may conceive a bark of baser kind by bud of nobler race. This is an art which does mend nature, change it rather, but the art itself is nature. Secondly, I argue from the effects of metre. As far as metre acts in and for itself, it tends to increase the vivacity and susceptibility both of the general feelings and of the attention. This effect it produces by the continued excitement of surprise, and by the quick reciprocations of curiosity still gratified and still re-excited, which are too slight indeed to be at any one moment objects of distinct consciousness, yet become considerable in their aggregate influence. As a medicated atmosphere, or as wine during animated conversation, they act powerfully, though themselves unnoticed, where, therefore, correspondent food and appropriate matter are not provided for the attention and feelings thus roused, there must needs be a disappointment felt, like that of leaping in the dark from the last step of a staircase, when we had prepared our muscles for a leap of three or four. The discussion on the powers of metre in the preface is highly ingenious and touches at all points on truth, but I cannot find any statement of its powers considered abstractly and separately. On the contrary, Mr. Wordsworth seems always to estimate metre by the powers which it exerts during, and, as I think, in consequence of, its combination with other elements of poetry. Thus the previous difficulty is left unanswered, what the elements are, with which it must be combined, in order to produce its own effects to any pleasurable purpose. Double and trisyllable rhymes, indeed, form a lower species of wit, and, attended to exclusively for their own sake, may become a source of momentary amusement, as in poor Smart's dystic to the Welsh squire who had promised him a hare. Tell me, thou son of great Cadwallader, hast sent the hare, or hast thou swallowed her? But for any poetic purposes, metre resembles, if the aptness of the simile may excuse its meanness, yeast, worthless or disagreeable by itself, but giving vivacity and spirit to the liquor with which it is proportionally combined. The reference to the children in the wood by no means satisfies my judgment. We all willingly throw ourselves back for a while into the feelings of our childhood. This ballad, therefore, we read under such recollections of our own childish feelings, as would equally endear to us poems, which Mr. Wordsworth himself would regard as faulty in the opposite extreme of gaudy and technical ornament. Before the invention of printing, and in a still greater degree, before the introduction of writing, metre, especially alliterative metre, whether alliterative at the beginning of the words, as in Piers Plowman, or at the end, as in rhymes, possessed an independent value as assisting the recollection, and consequently the preservation, of any series of truths or incidents. But I am not convinced by the collation of facts, that the children in the wood owes either its preservation or its popularity, to its metrical form. Mr. Marshall's repository affords a number of tales in prose inferior in pathos and general merit, some of as old a date, and many as widely popular. Tom Hickathrift, Jack the Giant Killer, Goody Two-Shoes, and Little Red Riding Hood are formidable rivals, and that they have continued in prose cannot be fairly explained by the assumption that the comparative meanness of their thoughts and images precluded even the humblest forms of metre. The scene of Goody Two-Shoes in the church is perfectly susceptible of metrical narration, and among the thaumata thaumastotata even of the present age, I do not recollect a more astonishing image than that of the whole rookery that flew out of the giant's beard, scared by the tremendous voice with which this monster answered the challenge of the heroic Tom Hickathrift. If from these we turn to compositions universally and independently of all early associations, beloved and admired, would the Maria, the monk, or the poor man's ass or stern be read with more delight, or have a better chance of immortality, had they without any change in the diction been composed in rhyme, than in their present state? If I am not grossly mistaken, the general reply would be in the negative. Nay, I will confess that in Mr. Wordsworth's own volumes, the anecdote for fathers, Simon Lee, Alice Fell, Beggars, and the Sailor's Mother, notwithstanding the beauties which are to be found in each of them, where the poet interposes the music of his own thoughts, would have been more delightful to me in prose, told and managed, as by Mr. Wordsworth they would have been, in a moral essay or pedestrian tour. Metre in itself is simply a stimulant of the attention, and therefore excites the question, why is the attention to be thus stimulated? Now the question cannot be answered by the pleasure of the metre itself, for this we have shown to be conditional and dependent on the appropriateness of the thoughts and expressions to which the metrical form is superadded. Neither can I conceive any other answer that can be rationally given short of this. I write in metre because I am about to use a language different from that of prose. 
Besides, where the language is not such, how interesting soever the reflections are, that are capable of being drawn by a philosophic mind from the thoughts or incidents of the poem, the meat itself must often become feeble. Take the last three stanzas of The Sailor's Mother, for instance. If I could for a moment abstract from the effect produced on the author's feelings as a man, by the instant at the time of its real occurrence, I would dare appeal to his own judgment, whether in the meat itself he found a sufficient reason for their being written metrically. And thus continuing, she said, I had a son who many a day sailed on the seas, but he is dead. In Denmark he was cast away, and I have travelled far as Hull to see what clothes he might have left or other property. The bird and cage they both were his. T'was my son's bird, and neat and trim he kept it. Many voyages this singing bird hath gone with him. When last he sailed he left the bird behind, as it might be perhaps from bodings of his mind. He to a fellow lodger's care had left it, to be watched and fed, till he came back again, and there I found it when my son was dead. And now God help me for my little wit. I trail it with me, sir, he took so much delight in it. If, disproportioning the emphasis, we read these stanzas so as to make the rhymes perceptible, even trisyllable rhymes could scarcely produce an equal sense of oddity and strangeness, as we feel here in finding rhymes at all in sentences so exclusively colloquial. I would further ask whether, but for that visionary state, into which the figure of the woman and the susceptibility of his own genius had placed the poet's imagination, a state which spreads its influence and colouring over all, that coexists with the exciting cause in which the simplest and the most familiar things gain a strange power of spreading awe around them. I would ask the poet whether he would not have felt an abrupt downfall in these verses from the preceding stanza. The ancient spirit is not dead. Old times, thought I, are breathing there. Proud was I that my country bred such strength, a dignity so fair. She begged an alms, like one in poor estate. I looked at her again, nor did my pride abate. It must not be omitted, and is besides worthy of notice, that those stanzas furnish the only fair instance that I have been able to discover in all Mr. Wordsworth's writing, of an actual adoption, or true imitation, of the real and very language of low and rustic life, freed from provincialisms. Thirdly, I deduce the position from all the causes elsewhere assigned which render metre the proper form of poetry, and poetry imperfect and defective without metre. Metre, therefore, having been connected with poetry most often, and by a peculiar fitness, whatever else is combined with metre must, though it be not itself essentially poetic, have nevertheless some property in common with poetry, as an intermedium of affinity, a sort, if I may dare borrow a well-known phrase from technical chemistry, of mordant between it and the superadded metre. Now poetry, Mr. Wordsworth truly affirms, does always imply passion, which word must be here understood, in its most general sense, as an excited state of the feelings and faculties. And as every passion has its proper pulse, so will it likewise have its characteristic modes of expression. But where there exists that degree of genius and talent which entitles a writer to aim at the honours of a poet, the very act of poetic composition itself is, and is allowed to imply and to produce, an unusual state of excitement, which of course justifies and demands, a correspondent difference of language, as truly, though not perhaps in as marked a degree, as the excitement of love, fear, rage, or jealousy. The vividness of the descriptions or declamations in Dunn or Dryden is as much and as often derived from the force and fervour of the describer as from the reflections, forms, or incidents which constitute their subject and materials. The wheels take fire from the mere rapidity of their motion. To what extent and under what modifications this may be admitted to act, I shall attempt to define in an after-remark on Mr. Wordsworth's reply to this objection, or rather on his objection to this reply, as already anticipated in his preface. Fourthly, and as intimately connected with this, if not the same argument in a more general form, I adduce the high spiritual instinct of the human being impelling us to seek unity by harmonious adjustment, and thus establishing the principle that all the parts of an organised whole must be assimilated to the more important and essential parts. This and the preceding arguments may be strengthened by the reflection that the composition of a poem is among the imitative arts, and that imitation, as opposed to copying, consists either in the interfusion of the same throughout the radically different, or of the different throughout a base radically the same. Lastly, I appeal to the practice of the best poets of all countries and in all ages, as authorising the opinion, deduced from all the foregoing, that in every import of the word essential, which would not here involve a mere truism, there may be, is, and ought to be, an essential difference between the language of prose and of metrical composition. In Mr. Wordsworth's criticism of Gray's sonnet, the reader's sympathy with his praise or blame of the different parts is taken for granted rather perhaps too easily. He has not, at least, attempted to win or compel it by argumentative analysis, 
in my conception at least the lines rejected as of no value do with the exception of the two first differ as much and as little from the language of common life as those which he has printed in italics as possessing genuine excellence of the five lines thus honourably distinguished two of them differ from prose even more widely than the lines which either proceed or follow in the position of the words a different object do these eyes require my lonely anguish melts no heart but mine and in my breast the imperfect joys expire but were it otherwise what would this prove but a truth of which no man ever doubted vide licet that there are sentences which would be equally in their place both in verse and prose assuredly it does not prove the point which alone requires proof namely that there are not passages which would suit the one and not suit the other the first line of this sonnet is distinguished from the ordinary language of men by the epithet to morning for we will set aside at present the consideration that the particular word smiling is hackneyed and as it involves a sort of personification not quite congruous with the common and material attribute of shining and doubtless this adjunction of epithets for the purpose of additional description where no particular attention is demanded for the quality of the thing would be noticed as giving a poetic cast to a man's conversation should the sportsman exclaim come boys the rosy morning calls you up he will be supposed to have some song in his head but no one suspects this when he says a wet morning shall not confine us to our beds this then is either a defect in poetry or it is not whoever should decide in the affirmative i would request him to reperuse any one poem of any confessedly great poet from homer to milton or from ischlus to shakespeare and to strike out in thought i mean every instance of this kind if the number of these fancied erasures did not startle him or if he continued to deem the work improved by their total omission he must advance reasons of no ordinary strength and evidence reasons grounded in the essence of human nature otherwise i should not hesitate to consider him as a man not so much proof against all authority as dead to it the second line and reddening phoebus lifts his golden fire has indeed almost as many faults as words but then it is a bad line not because the language is distinct from that of prose but because it conveys incongruous images because it confounds the cause and the effect the real thing with the personified representative of the thing in short because it differs from the language of good sense that the phoebus is hackneyed and a schoolboy image is an accidental fault dependent on the age in which the author wrote and not deduced from the nature of the thing that it is part of an exploded mythology is an objection more deeply grounded yet when the torch of ancient learning was rekindled so cheering were its beams that our eldest poets cut off by christianity from all accredited machinery and deprived of all acknowledged guardians and symbols of the great objects of nature were naturally induced to adopt as a poetic language those fabulous personages those forms of the supernatural in nature which had given them such dear delight in the poems of their great masters nay even at this day what scholar of genial taste will not so far sympathize with them as to read with pleasure in petrarch chaucer or spencer what he would perhaps condemn as puerile in a modern poet i remember no poet whose writings would safely stand the test of mr wordsworth's theory than spencer yet will mr wordsworth say that the style of the following stanza is either undistinguished from prose and the language of ordinary life or that it is vicious and that the stanzas are blots in the fairy queen by this the northern wagoner had set his sevenfold team behind the steadfast star that was in ocean waves yet never wet but firm is fixed and sendeth light from far to all that in the wild deep wandering are and cheerful chanticleer with his note shrill had worn once at phoebus fiery car in haste was climbing up the eastern hill full envious that night so long his room did fill at last the golden oriental gate of greatest heaven gan to open fair and phoebus fresh as bridegroom to his mate came dancing forth shaking his dewy hair and hurled his glistering beams through gloomy air which when the wakeful elf perceived straightway he started up and did himself prepare in some bright arms and battler's array for with that pagan proud he combat will that day on the contrary to how many passages both in hymn-books and in blank verse poems could i were it not invidious direct the reader's attention the style of which is most unpoetic because and only because it is the style of prose he will not suppose me capable of having in my mind such verses as i put my hat upon my head and walked into the strand and there i met another man whose hat was in his hand to such specimens it would indeed be a fair and full reply that these lines are not bad because they are unpoetic but because they are empty of all sense and feeling and that it were an idle attempt to prove that an ape is not a newton when it is self-evident that he is not a man 
but the sense shall be good and weighty the language correct and dignified the subject interesting and treated with feeling and yet the style shall notwithstanding all these merits be justly blamable as prosaic and solely because the words and the order of the words would find their appropriate place in prose but are not suitable to metrical composition the civil wars of daniel is an instructive and even interesting work but take the following stanzas and from the hundred instances which abound i might probably have selected others far more striking and to the end we may with better ease discern the true discourse vouchsafe to shew what were the times for going near to these that these we may with better profit know tell how the world fell into this disease and how so great distemperature did grow so shall we see with what degrees it came how things at full do soon wax out of frame ten kings had from the norman conqueror reigned with intermix and variable fate when england to her greatest height attained of power dominion glory wealth and state after it had with much ado sustained the violence of princes with debate for titles and the often mutinies of nobles for their ancient liberties for first the norman conquering all by might by might was forced to keep what he had got mixing our customs and the form of right with foreign constitutions he had brought mastering the mighty humbling the poorer white by all severest means that could be wrought and making the succession doubtful rent his new-got state and left it turbulent will it be contended on the one side that these lines are mean and senseless or on the other that they are not prosaic and for that reason unpoetic the poet's well-merited epithet is that of the well-languaged daniel but likewise and by the consent of his contemporaries no less than of all succeeding critics the prosaic daniel yet those who thus designate this wise and amiable writer from the frequent incorrespondency of his diction to his metre in the majority of his compositions not only deem them valuable and interesting on other accounts but willingly admit that they are to be found throughout his poems and especially in his epistles and in his hymen's triumphs many and exquisite specimens of that style which as the neutral ground of prose and verse is common to both a fine and almost faultless extract eminent as for other beauties so for its perfection in this species of diction may be seen in lamb's dramatic specimens a work of various interest from the nature of the selections themselves or from the plays of shakespeare's contemporaries and deriving a high additional value from the notes which are full of just and original criticism expressed with all the freshness of originality among the possible effects of practical adherence to a theory that aims to identify the style of prose and verse if it does not indeed claim for the latter a yet nearer resemblance to the average style of men in the viva voce intercourse of real life we might anticipate the following as not the least likely to occur it will happen as i have indeed before observed that the metre itself the sole acknowledged difference will occasionally become metre to the eye only the existence of prosaisms and that they detract from the merit of a poem must at length be conceded when a number of successive lines can be rendered even to the most delicate ear unrecognizable as verse or as having even been intended for verse by simply transcribing them as prose when if the poem be in blank verse this can be effected without any alteration or at most by merely restoring one or two words to their proper places from which they have been transplanted for no assignable cause or reason but that of the author's convenience but if it be in rhyme by the mere exchange of the final word of each line for some other of the same meaning equally appropriate dignified and euphonic the answer or objection in the preface to the anticipated remark that metre paves the way to other distinctions is contained in the following words the distinction of rhyme and metre is regular and uniform and not like that produced by what is usually called poetic diction arbitrary and subject to infinite caprices upon which no calculation whatever can be made in the one case the reader is utterly at the mercy of the poet respecting what imagery or diction he may choose to connect with the passion but is this a poet of whom a poet is speaking no surely rather of a fool or madman or at best of a vain or ignorant phantast and might not brains so wild and so deficient make just the same havoc with rhymes and metres as they are supposed to effect with modes and figures of speech how is the reader at the mercy of such men if he continue to read their nonsense is it not his own fault the ultimate end of criticism is much more to establish the principles of writing than to furnish rules how to pass judgment on what has been written by others if indeed it were possible that the two could be separated but if it be asked by what principles the poet is to regulate his own style if he do not adhere closely to the sort and order of words which he hears in the market wake high-road or plough-field 
i reply by principles the ignorance or neglect of which would convict him of being no poet but a silly or presumptuous usurper of the name by the principles of grammar logic psychology in one word by such a knowledge of the facts material and spiritual that most appertain to his art as if it have been governed and applied by good sense and rendered instinctive by habit becomes the representative and reward of our past conscious reasonings insights and conclusions and acquires the name of taste by what rule that does not leave the reader at the poet's mercy and the poet at his own is the latter to distinguish between the language suitable to suppressed and the language which is characteristic of indulged anger or between that of rage and that of jealousy is it obtained by wandering about in search of angry or jealous people in uncultivated society in order to copy their words or not far rather by the power of imagination proceeding upon the all in each of human nature by meditation rather than by observation and by the latter in consequence only of the former as eyes for which the former has predetermined their field of vision and to which as to its organ it communicates a microscopic power there is not i firmly believe a man now living who has from his own inward experience a clearer intuition than mr wordsworth himself that the last mentioned are the two sources of genial discrimination through the same process and by the same creative agency will the poet distinguish the degree and kind of the excitement produced by the very act of poetic composition as intuitively will he know what differences of style it at once inspires and justifies what intermixture of conscious volition is natural to that state and in what instances such figures and colours of speech degenerate into mere creatures of an arbitrary purpose cold technical artifices of ornament or connection for even as truth is its own light and evidence discovering at once itself and falsehood so is it the prerogative of poetic genius to distinguish by parental instinct its proper offspring from the changelings which the gnomes of vanity or the fairies of fashion may have laid in its cradle or called by its names could a rule be given from without poetry would cease to be poetry and sink into a mechanical art it would be morphosis not poesis the rules of the imagination are themselves the very powers of growth and production the words to which they are reducible present only the outlines and external appearance of the fruit a deceptive counterfeit of the superficial form and colours may be elaborated but the marble peach feels cold and heavy and children only put it to their mouths we find no difficulty in admitting as excellent and the legitimate language of poetic fervour self-impassioned dunn's apostrophe to the sun in the second stanza of his progress of the soul thee eye of heaven this great soul envies not by thy male force is all we have begot in the first east thou now beginst to shine sucks early balm and island spices there and wilt anon in thy loose reined career at tagus po sen thames and danau dine and see at night this western world of mine yet hast thou not more nations seen than she who before thee one day began to be and thy frail light being quenched shall long long outlive thee or the next stanza but one great destiny the commissary of god that has marked out a path and period for everything who where we offspring took our ways and ends ceased at one instant thou not of all causes thou whose changeless brow ne'er smiles nor frowns oh vouchsafe thou to look and show my story in thy eternal book etc as little difficulty do we find in excluding from the honours of unaffected warmth and elevation the madness prepense of pseudo poesy or the startling hysteric of weakness over exerting itself which bursts on the unprepared reader in sundry odes and apostrophes to abstract terms such are the odes to jealousy to hope to oblivion and the like in dodsley's collection and the magazines of that day which seldom fail to remind me of an oxford copy of verses on the two suttons commencing with inoculation heavenly maid descend it is not to be denied that men of undoubted talents and even poets of true though not of first-rate genius have from a mistaken theory deluded both themselves and others in the opposite extreme i once read to a company of sensible and well-educated women the introductory period of cowley's preface to his pindaric odes written in imitation of the style and manner of the odes of pindar if says cowley a man should undertake to translate pindar word for word it would be thought that one madman had translated another as may appear when he that understands not the original reads the verbal traduction of him into latin prose than which nothing seems more raving i then proceeded with his own free version of the second olympic composed for the charitable purpose of rationalizing the theban eagle queen of all harmonious things dancing words and speaking strings what god what hero wilt thou sing what happy man to equal glories bring begin begin thy noble choice and let the hills around reflect the image of thy voice pisa does to jove belong 
jove and pisa claim thy song the fair first fruits of war the olympic games alcides offered up to jove alcides too thy strings may move but oh what man to join with these can worthy prove join theron boldly to their sacred names theron the next honour claims theron to no man gives place if first in pisa's and in virtue's race theron there and he alone even his own swift forefathers has outgone one of the company exclaimed with the full assent of the rest that if the original were madder than this it must be incurably mad i then translated the ode from the greek and as nearly as possible word for word and the impression was that in the general movement of the periods in the form of the connections and transitions and in the sober majesty of lofty sense it appeared to them to approach more nearly than any other poetry they had heard to the style of our bible in the prophetic books the first strophe will suffice as a specimen ye harp controlling hymns or ye hymns the sovereigns of harps what god what hero what man shall we celebrate truly pisa indeed is of jove but the olympiad or the olympic games did hercules establish the first fruits of the spoils of war but theron for the four-horsed car that bore victory to him it behoves us now to voice aloud the just the hospitable the bulwark of agrigentum of renowned fathers the flower even him who preserves his native city erect and safe but are such rhetorical caprices condemnable only for their deviation from the language of real life and are they by no other means to be precluded but by the rejection of all distinctions between prose and verse save that of metre surely good sense and a moderate insight into the constitution of the human mind would be amply sufficient to prove that such language and such combinations are the native product neither of the fancy nor of the imagination that the operation consists in the excitement of surprise by the juxtaposition and apparent reconciliation of widely different or incompatible things as when for instance the hills are made to reflect the image of a voice surely no unusual taste is requisite to see clearly that this compulsory juxtaposition is not produced by the presentation of impressive or delightful forms to the inward vision nor by any sympathy with the modifying powers with which the genius of the poet had united and inspirited all the objects of his thought that it is therefore a species of wit a pure work of the will and implies a leisure and self-possession both of thought and of feeling incompatible with the steady fervour of a mind possessed and filled with the grandeur of its subject to sum up the whole in one sentence when a poem or a part of a poem shall be adduced which is evidently vicious in the figures and sentexture of its style yet for the condemnation of which no reason can be assigned except that it differs from the style in which men actually converse then and not till then can i hold this theory to be either plausible or practicable or capable of furnishing either rule guidance or precaution that might not more easily and more safely as well as more naturally have been deduced in the author's own mind from considerations of grammar logic and the truth and nature of things confirmed by the authority of works whose fame is not of one country nor of one age End of chapter eighteen Chapter nineteen of Biographia Literaria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Chapter nineteen. Continuation. Concerning the real object which it is probable Mr. Wordsworth had before him in his critical preface. Elucidation and application of this it might appear from some passages in the former part of mr wordsworth's preface that he meant to confine his theory of style and the necessity of a close accordance with the actual language of men to those particular subjects from low and rustic life which by way of experiment he had purposed to naturalize as a new species in our english poetry but from the train of argument that follows from the reference to milton and from the spirit of his critique on gray's sonnet those sentences appear to have been rather courtesies of modesty than actual limitations of his system yet so groundless does his system appear on a close examination and so strange and overwhelming in its consequences that i cannot and i do not believe that the poet did ever himself adopt it in the unqualified sense in which his expressions have been understood by others and which indeed according to all the common laws of interpretation they seem to bear what then did he mean i apprehend that in the clear perception not unaccompanied with disgust or contempt 
of the gaudy affectations of a style which passed current with too many for poetic diction though in truth it had as little pretensions to poetry as to logic or common sense he narrowed his view for the time and feeling a justifiable preference for the language of nature and of good sense even in its humblest and least ornamented forms he suffered himself to express in terms at once too large and too exclusive his predilection for a style the most remote possible from the false and showy splendour which he wished to explode it is possible that this predilection at first merely comparative deviated for a time into direct partiality but the real object which he had in view was i doubt not a species of excellence which had been long before most happily characterised by the judicious and amiable garve whose works are so justly beloved and esteemed by the germans in his remarks on gellert from which the following is literally translated the talent that is required in order to make excellent verses is perhaps greater than the philosopher is ready to admit or would find it in his power to acquire the talent to seek only the apt expression of the thought and yet to find at the same time with it the rhyme and the metre gellert possessed this happy gift if ever any one of our poets possessed it and nothing perhaps contributed more to the great and universal impression which his fables made on their first publication or conduces more to their continued popularity it was a strange and curious phenomenon and such as in germany had been previously unheard of to read verses in which everything was expressed just as one would wish to talk and yet all dignified attractive and interesting and all at the same time perfectly correct as to the measure of the syllables and the rhyme it is certain that poetry when it has attained this excellence makes a far greater impression than prose so much so indeed that even the gratification which the very rhymes afford becomes then no longer a contemptible or trifling gratification however novel this phenomenon may have been in germany at the time of gellert it is by no means new nor yet of recent existence in our language spite of the licentiousness with which spenser occasionally compels the orthography of his words into a subservience to his rhymes the whole fairy queen is an almost continued instance of this beauty wallace's song go lovely rose is doubtless familiar to most of my readers but if i had happened to have had by me the poems of cotton more but far less deservedly celebrated as the author of the virgil travestied i should have indulged myself and i think have gratified many who are not acquainted with his serious works by selecting some admirable specimens of this style there are not a few poems in that volume replete with every excellence of thought image and passion which we expect or desire in the poetry of the milder muse and yet so worded that the reader sees no one reason either in the selection or the order of the words why he might not have said the very same in an appropriate conversation and cannot conceive how indeed he could have expressed such thoughts otherwise without loss or injury to his meaning but in truth our language is and from the first dawn of poetry ever has been particularly rich in compositions distinguished by this excellence the final e which is now mute in chaucer's age was either sounded or dropped indifferently we ourselves still use either beloved or beloved according as the rhyme or measure or the purpose of more or less solemnity may require let the reader then only adopt the pronunciation of the poet and of the court at which he lived both with respect to the final e and to the accentuation of the last syllable i would then venture to ask what even in the colloquial language of elegant and unaffected women who are the peculiar mistresses of pure english and undefiled what could we hear more natural or seemingly more unstudied than the following stanzas from chaucer's troilus and crusade and after this forth to the gate he went there as crusade out rode a full good pass and up and down there made he many a went and to himself full oft he said alas from hence rode my bliss and my solace as would blissful god now for his joy I might have seen again come into Troy, and to the yonder hill I gan her bide, alas, and there I take of her my leave, and yond I saw her to her father ride, for sorrow of which mine heart shall to cleave, and hither home I came when it was eve, and here I dwell outcast from all her joy, and steal till I may seen her eft in Troy, and of himself imagined he off, to been defated pale and waxen less than he was wont, and that men said in soft, what may it be? who can the soother guess why troilus hath all this heaviness and all this nas but his melancholy that he had of himself such fantasy another time imaginin he would that every wight that passed him by the way had of him ruth and that they say and should i am right sorry troilus will day and thus he drove a day yet forth or tway as ye have heard such life gan he to lead as he that stood betwixt in hope and dread for which him like it in his song a shoe the encasin of his woe as he best might and made a song of words but a few somewhat his woeful hearter for to light 
and when he was from every manner's sight with softer voice he of his lady dear that absent was gan sing as ye may hear this song when he thus sung and had full bone he fill again into his sires old and every night as was his wont to don he stood the bright mooner to behold and all his sorrow to the moon he told and said i wis when thou art horned new i shall be glad if all the world be true another exquisite master of this species of style where the scholar and the poet supplies the material but the perfect well-bred gentleman the expressions and the arrangement is george herbert as from the nature of the subject and the too frequent quaintness of the thoughts his temple or sacred poems and private ejaculations are comparatively but little known i shall extract two poems the first is a sonnet equally admirable for the weight number and expression of the thoughts and for the simple dignity of the language unless indeed a fastidious taste should object to the latter half of the sixth line the second is a poem of greater length which i have chosen not only for the present purpose but likewise as a striking example and illustration of an assertion hazarded in a former page of these sketches namely that the characteristic fault of our elder poets is the reverse of that which distinguishes too many of our more recent versifiers the one conveying the most fantastic thoughts in the most correct and natural language the other in the most fantastic language conveying the most trivial thoughts the latter is a riddle of words the former an enigma of thoughts the one reminds me of an odd passage in drayton's ideas as other men so i myself do muse why in this sort i rest invention so and why these giddy metaphors i use leaving the path the greater part do go i will resolve you i am lunatic the other recalls a still odder passage in the synagogue or the shadow of the temple a connected series of poems in imitation of herbert's temple and in some editions annexed to it oh how my mind is gravelled not a thought that i can find but's ravelled all to naught short ends of threads and narrow shreds of lists knots snarled ruffs loose broken tufts of twists are my torn meditations ragged clothing which wound and woven shape a suit for nothing one while i think and then i am in pain to think how to unthink that thought again immediately after these burlesque passages i cannot proceed to the extracts promised without changing the ludicrous tone of feeling by the interposition of the three following stanzas of herbert's virtue sweet day so cool so calm so bright the bridal of the earth and sky the dew shall weep thy fall to-night for thou must die sweet rose whose hue angry and brave bids the rash gazer wipe his eye thy root is ever in its grave and thou must die sweet spring full of sweet days and roses a box where sweets compacted lie my music shoes ye have your closes and all must die the bosom sin a sonnet by george herbert lord with what care hast thou begirt us round parents first season us then schoolmasters deliver us to laws they send us bound to rules of reason holy messengers pulpits and sundays sorrow dogging sin affliction sorted anguish of all sizes fine nets and stratagems to catch us in bibles laid open millions of surprises blessings beforehand ties of gratefulness the sound of glory ringing in our ears without our shame within our consciences angels and grace eternal hopes and fears yet all these fences and their whole array one cunning bosom sin blows quite away love unknown dear friend sit down the tale is long and sad and in my faintings i presume your love will more comply than help a lord i had and have of whom some grounds which may improve i hold for two lives and both lives in me to him i brought a dish of fruit one day and in the middle place my heart but he i sigh to say looked on a servant who did know his eye better than you know me or which is one than i myself the servant instantly quitting the fruit seized on my heart alone and threw it in a font wherein did fall a stream of blood which issued from the side of a great rock i well remember all and have good cause there it was dipped and dyed and washed and wrung the very wringing yet and forceth tears your heart was foul i fear indeed tis true i did and do commit many a fault more than my lease will bear yet still asked pardon and was not denied but you shall hear after my heart was well and clean and fair as i one eventide i sigh to tell walked by myself abroad i saw a large and spacious furnace flaming and thereon a boiling cauldron round about whose verge was in great letters set affliction the greatness shewed the owner so i went to fetch a sacrifice out of my fold 
thinking with that which i did thus present to warm his love which i did fear grew cold but as my heart did tender it the man who was to take it from me slipped his hand and threw my heart into the scalding pan my heart that brought it do you understand the offerer's heart your heart was hard i fear indeed tis true i found a callous matter began to spread and to expatiate there but with a richer drug than scalding water i bathed it often even with holy blood which at a board while many drank bare wine a friend did steal into my cup for good even taken inwardly and most divine to supple hardnesses but at the length out of the cauldron getting soon i fled unto my house where to repair the strength which i had lost i hasted to my bed but when i thought to sleep out all these faults i sigh to speak i found that some had stuffed the bed with thoughts i would say thorns dear could my heart not break when with my pleasures even my rest was gone full well i understood who had been there for i had given the key to none but one it must be he your heart was dull i fear indeed a slack and sleepy state of mind did oft possess me so that when i prayed though my lips went my heart did stay behind but all my scores were by another paid who took my guilt upon him truly friend for aught i hear your master shews to you more favour than you wot of mark the end the font did only what was old renew the cauldron supplied what was grown too hard the thorns did quicken what was grown too dull all did but strive to mend what you had marred wherefore be cheered and praise him to the full each day each hour each moment of the week who fain would have you be new tender quick End of chapter nineteen Chapter twenty of Biographia Literaria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Chapter nineteen. Chapter twenty. The former subject continued. The neutral style, or that common to prose and poetry, exemplified by specimens from Chaucer, Herbert, and others. I have no fear in declaring my conviction that the excellence defined and exemplified in the preceding chapter is not the characteristic excellence of mr wordsworth's style because i can add with equal sincerity that it is precluded by higher powers the praise of uniform adherence to genuine logical english is undoubtedly his nay laying the main emphasis on the word uniform i will dare add that of all contemporary poets it is his alone for in a less absolute sense of the word I should certainly include Mr. Bowes, Lord Byron, and, as to all his later writings, Mr. Southey, the exceptions in their works being so few and unimportant. But of the specific excellence described in the quotation from Garver, I appear to find more and more undoubted specimens in the works of others, for instance among the minor poems of Mr. Thomas Moore, and of our illustrious laureate. To me it will always remain a singular and noticeable fact, that a theory which would establish this lingua communis not only as the best but as the only commendable style should have proceeded from a poet whose diction next to that of shakespeare and milton appears to me of all others the most individualized and characteristic and let it be remembered too that i am now interpreting the controverted passages of mr wordsworth's critical preface by the purpose and object which he may be supposed to have intended rather than by the sense which the words themselves must convey if they are taken without this allowance a person of any taste who had but studied three or four of shakespeare's principal plays would without the name affixed scarcely fail to recognize as shakespeare's a quotation from any other play though but of a few lines a similar peculiarity though in a less degree attends mr wordsworth's style whenever he speaks in his own person or whenever though under a feigned name it is clear that he himself is still speaking as in the different dramatis personae of the recluse even in the other poems in which he purposes to be most dramatic there are few in which it does not occasionally burst forth the reader might often address the poet in his own words with reference to the persons introduced it seems as i retrace the ballad line by line that but half of it is theirs and the better half is thine who having been previously acquainted with any considerable portion of mr wordsworth's publications and having studied them with a full feeling of the author's genius would not at once claim as wordsworthian the little poem on the rainbow the childless father of the man etc or in the lucy gray no mate no comrade lucy knew she dwelt on a wide moor the sweetest thing that ever grew beside a human door or in the idle shepherd boys 
along the river's stony marge the sand lark chants a joyous song the thrush is busy in the wood and carols loud and strong a thousand lambs are on the rocks all newly born both earth and sky keep jubilee and more than all those boys with their green coronal they never hear the cry that plaintive cry which up the hill comes from the depth of dungeon gill need i mention the exquisite description of the sea-lock in the blind highland boy who but a poet tells a tale in such language to the little ones by the fireside as yet had he many a restless dream both when he heard the eagle scream and when he heard the torrents roar and heard the water beat the shore near where their cottage stood beside a lake their cottage stood not small like ours a peaceful flood but one of mighty size and strange that rough or smooth is full of change and stirring in its bed for to this lake by night and day the great sea-water finds its way through long long windings of the hills and drinks up all the pretty rills and rivers large and strong then hurries back the road it came returns on errands still the same this did it when the earth was new and this for evermore will do as long as earth shall last and with the coming of the tide come boats and ships that sweetly ride between the woods and lofty rocks and to the shepherds with their flocks bring tales of distant lands i might quote almost the whole of his ruth but take the following stanzas but as you have before been told this stripling sportive gay and bold and with his dancing crest so beautiful through savage lands had roamed about with vagrant bands of indians in the west the wind the tempest roaring high the tumult of a tropic sky might well be dangerous food for him a youth to whom was given so much of earth so much of heaven and such impetuous blood whatever in those climes he found irregular in sight or sound did to his mind impart a kindred impulse seemed allied to his own powers and justified the workings of his heart nor less to feed voluptuous thought the beauteous forms of nature wrought fair trees and lovely flowers the breezes their own languor lent the stars had feelings which they sent into those magic bowers yet in his worst pursuits i ween that sometimes there did intervene pure hopes of high intent for passions linked to forms so fair and stately needs must have their share of noble sentiment but from mr wordsworth's more elevated compositions which already form three-fourths of his works and will i trust constitute hereafter a still larger proportion from these whether in rhyme or blank verse it would be difficult and almost superfluous to select instances of a diction peculiarly his own of a style which cannot be imitated without its being at once recognised as originating in mr wordsworth it would not be easy to open on any one of his loftier strains that does not contain examples of this and more in proportion as the lines are more excellent and most like the author for those who may happen to have been less familiar with his writings i will give three specimens taken with little choice the first from the lines on the boy of winander mere who blew mimic hootings to the silent owls that they might answer him and they would shout across the watery vale and shout again with long halloos and screams and echoes loud redoubled and redoubled concourse wild of mirth and jocund din and when it chanced that pauses of deep silence mocked his skill then sometimes in that silence while he hung listening a gentle shock of mild surprise has carried far into his heart the voice of mountain torrents or the visible scene would enter unawares into his mind with all its solemn imagery its rocks its woods and that uncertain heaven received into the bosom of the steady lake the second shall be that noble imitation of drayton if it was not rather a coincidence in the lines to joanna when i had gazed perhaps two minutes space joanna looking in my eyes beheld that ravishment of mine and laughed aloud the rock like something starting from a sleep took up the lady's voice and laughed again that ancient woman seated on helm crag was ready with her cavern hammer scar and the tall steep of silver house sent forth a noise of laughter southern longbrig heard and fairfield answered with a mountain tone Helvellyn far into the clear blue sky carried the lady's voice old skiddor blew his speaking trumpet back out of the clouds from glaramara southward came the voice and kirkstone tossed it from its misty head the third which is in rhyme i take from the song at the feast of broom castle upon the restoration of lord clifford the shepherd to the estates and honours of his ancestors now another day is come fitter hope and nobler doom he hath thrown aside his crook and hath buried deep his book armour rusting in his halls on the blood of clifford calls quell the scot exclaims the lance bear me to the heart of france 
is the longing of the shield tell thy name thou trembling field field of death where'er thou be groan thou with our victory happy day and mighty hour when our shepherd in his power mailed and horsed with lance and sword to his ancestors restored like a reappearing star like a glory from afar first shall head the flock of war alas the fervent harper did not know that for a tranquil soul the lay was framed who long compelled in humble walks to go was softened into feeling soothed and tamed love had he found in huts where poor men lie his daily teachers had been woods and rills the silence that is in the starry sky the sleep that is among the lonely hills the words themselves in the foregoing extracts are no doubt sufficiently common for the greater part but in what poem are they not so if we accept a few misadventurous attempts to translate the arts and sciences into verse in the excursion the number of polysyllabic or what the common people call dictionary words is more than usually great and so must it needs be in proportion to the number and variety of an author's conceptions and his solicitude to express them with precision but are those words in those places commonly employed in real life to express the same thought or outward thing are they the style used in the ordinary intercourse of spoken words no nor are the modes of connections and still less the breaks and transitions would any but a poet at least could any one without being conscious that he had expressed himself with noticeable vivacity have described a bird singing loud by the thrush is busy in the wood or have spoken of boys with a string of club moss round their rusty hats as the boys with their green coronal or have translated a beautiful may day into both earth and sky keep jubilee or have brought all the different marks and circumstances of a sea-lock before the mind as the actions of a living and acting power or have represented the reflection of the sky in the water as that uncertain heaven received into the bosom of the steady lake even the grammatical construction is not unfrequently peculiar as the wind the tempest roaring high the tumult of a tropic sky might well be dangerous food to him a youth to whom was given etc there is a peculiarity in the frequent use of the asymataton that is the omission of the connective particle before the last of several words or several sentences used grammatically as single words all being in the same case and governing or governed by the same verb and not less in the construction of words by apposition to him a youth in short were they excluded from mr wordsworth's poetic compositions all that a little adherence to the theory of his preface would exclude two-thirds at least of the marked beauties of his poetry must be erased for a far greater number of lines would be sacrificed than in any other reason poet because the pleasure received from wordsworth's poems being less derived either from excitement of curiosity or the rapid flow of narration the striking passages form a larger proportion of their value i do not adduce it as a fair criterion of comparative excellence nor do i even think it such but merely as matter of fact i affirm that from no contemporary writer could so many lines be quoted without reference to the poem in which they are found for their own independent weight or beauty from the sphere of my own experience i can bring to my recollection three persons of no everyday powers and acquirements who had read the poems of others with more and more unallied pleasure and had thought more highly of their authors as poets who yet have confessed to me that from no modern work had so many passages started up anew in their minds at different times and as different occasions had awakened a meditative mood end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of biographia literaria this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee biographia literaria by samuel taylor coleridge chapter twenty one remarks on the present mode of conducting critical journals long have i wished to see a fair and philosophical inquisition into the character of wordsworth as a poet on the evidence of his published works and a positive not a comparative appreciation of their characteristic excellencies deficiencies and defects i know no claim that the mere opinion of any individual can have to weigh down the opinion of the author himself against the probability of whose parental partiality we ought to set that of his having thought longer and more deeply on the subject but i should call that investigation fair and philosophical in which the critic announces and endeavours to establish the principles which he holds for the foundation of poetry in general with the specification of these in their application to the different classes of poetry 
having thus prepared his canons of criticism for praise and condemnation he would proceed to particularize the most striking passages to which he deems them applicable faithfully noticing the frequent or infrequent recurrence of similar merits or defects and as faithfully distinguishing what is characteristic from what is accidental or a mere flagging of the wing then if his premises be rational his deductions legitimate and his conclusions justly applied the reader and possibly the poet himself may adopt his judgment in the light of judgment and in the independence of free agency if he has erred he presents his errors in a definite place and tangible form and holds the torch and guides the way to their detection i most willingly admit and estimate at a high value the services which the edinburgh review and others formed afterwards on the same plan have rendered to society in the diffusion of knowledge i think the commencement of the edinburgh review an important epoch in periodical criticism and that it has a claim upon the gratitude of the literary republic and indeed of the reading public at large for having originated the scheme of reviewing those books only which are susceptible and deserving of argumentative criticism not less meritorious and far more faithfully and in general far more ably executed is their plan of supplying the vacant place of the trash or mediocrity wisely left to sink into oblivion by its own weight with original essays on the most interesting subjects of the time religious or political in which the titles of the books or pamphlets prefixed furnish only the name and occasion of the disquisition i do not arraign the keenness or asperity of its damnatory style in and for itself as long as the author is addressed or treated as the mere impersonation of the work then under trial i have no quarrel with them on this account as long as no personal allusions are admitted and no recommitment for new trial of juvenile performances that were published perhaps forgotten many years before the commencement of the review since for the forcing back of such works to public notice no motives are easily assignable but such as are furnished to the critic by his own personal malignity or what is still worse by a habit of malignity in the form of mere wantonness no private grudge they need no personal spite the viva sectio is its own delight all enmity all envy they disclaim disinterested thieves of our good name cool sober murderers of their neighbour's fame s t c every censure every sarcasm respecting a publication which the critic with the criticised work before him can make good is the critic's right the writer is authorised to reply but not to complain neither can any one prescribe to the critic how soft or how hard how friendly or how bitter shall be the phrases which he is to select for the expression of such reprehension or ridicule the critic must know what effect it is his object to produce and with a view to this effect must he weigh his words but as soon as the critic betrays that he knows more of his author than the author's publications could have told him as soon as from this more intimate knowledge elsewhere obtained he avails himself of the slightest trait against the author his censure instantly becomes personal injury his sarcasms personal insults he ceases to be a critic and takes on him the most contemptible character to which a rational creature can be degraded that of a gossip backbiter and pasquillant but with this heavy aggravation that he steals the unquiet the deforming passions of the world into the museum into the very place which next to the chapel and oratory should be our sanctuary and secure place of refuge offers abominations on the altar of the muses and makes its sacred paling the very circle in which he conjures up the lying and profane spirit this determination of unlicensed personality and of permitted and legitimate censure which i owe in part to the illustrious lessing himself a model of acute spirited sometimes stinging but always argumentative and honourable criticism is beyond controversy the true one and though i would not myself exercise all the rights of the latter yet let but the former be excluded i submit myself to its exercise in the hands of others without complaint and without resentment let a communication be formed between any number of learned men in the various branches of science and literature and whether the president and central committee be in london or edinburgh if only they previously lay aside their individuality and pledge themselves inwardly as well as ostensibly to administer judgment according to a constitution and code of laws and if by grounding this code on the twofold basis of universal morals and philosophic reason independent of all foreseen application to particular works and authors they obtain the right to speak each as the representative of their body corporate they shall have honour and good wishes for me and i shall accord to them their fair dignities though self-assumed not less cheerfully than if i could inquire concerning them in the herald's office or turn to them in the book of peerage however loud may be the outcries for a prevented or subverted reputation however numerous and impatient the complaints of merciless severity and insupportable despotism i shall neither feel nor utter aught but to the defence and justification of the critical machine 
should any literary quixote find himself provoked by its sounds and regular movements i should admonish him with sancho panza that it is no giant but a windmill there it stands on its own place and its own hillock never goes out of its way to attack any one and to none and from none either gives or asks assistance when the public press has poured in any part of its produce between its millstones it grinds it off one man's sack the same as another and with whatever wind may happen to be then blowing all the two-and-thirty winds are alike its friends of the whole wide atmosphere it does not desire a single finger-breath more than what is necessary for its sails to turn round in but this space must be left free and unimpeded gnats beetles wasps butterflies and the whole tribe of ephemerals and insignificance may flit in and out and between may hum and buzz and jar may shrill their tiny pipes and wind their puny horns unchastised and unnoticed but idlers and bravados of larger size and prouder show must beware how they place themselves within its sweep much less may they presume to lay hands on the sails the strength of which is neither greater nor less than as the wind is which drives them round whomsoever the remorseless arm slings aloft or whirls along with it in the air he has himself alone to blame though when the same arm throws him from it it will more often double than break the force of his fall putting aside the too manifest and too frequent interference of national party and even personal predilection or aversion and reserving for deeper feelings those worse and more criminal intrusions into the sacredness of private life which not seldom merit legal rather than literary chastisement the two principal objects and occasions which i find for blame and regret in the conduct of the review in question are first its unfaithfulness to its own announced and excellent plan by subjecting to criticism works neither indecent nor immoral yet of such trifling importance even in point of size and according to the critic's own verdict so devoid of all merit as must excite in the most candid mind the suspicion either that dislike or vindictive feelings were at work or that there was a cold prudential predetermination to increase the sale of the review by flattering the malignant passions of human nature that i may not myself become subject to the charge which i am bringing against others by an accusation without proof i refer to the article on dr reynolds sermon in the very first number of the edinburgh review as an illustration of my meaning if in looking through all the succeeding volumes the reader should find this a solitary instance i must submit to that painful forfeiture of esteem which awaits a groundless or exaggerated charge the second point of objection belongs to this review only in common with all other works of periodical criticism at least it applies in common to the general system of all whatever exception there may be in favour of particular articles or if it attaches to the edinburgh review and to its only co-rival the quarterly with any peculiar force this results from the superiority of talent acquirement and information which both have so undeniably displayed and which doubtless deepens the regret though not the blame i am referring to the substitution of assertion for argument to the frequency of arbitrary and sometimes petulant verdicts not seldom unsupported even by a single quotation from the work condemned which might at least have explained the critic's meaning if it did not prove the justice of his sentence even where this is not the case the extracts are too often made without reference to any general grounds or rules from which the faultiness or inadmissibility of the qualities attributed may be deduced and without any attempt to show that the qualities are attributable to the passage extracted i have met with such extracts from mr wordsworth's poems annexed to such assertions as led me to imagine that the reviewer having written his critique before he had read the work had then pricked with a pin for passages wherewith to illustrate the various branches of his preconceived opinions by what principle of rational choice can we suppose a critic to have been directed at least in a christian country and himself we hope a christian who gives the following lines portraying the fervour of solitary devotion excited by the magnificent display of the almighty's works as a proof and example of an author's tendency to downright ravings and absolute unintelligibility o oh, then what soul was his when on the tops of the high mountains he beheld the sun rise up and bathe the world in light he looked ocean and earth the solid frame of earth and ocean's liquid mass beneath him lay in gladness and deep joy the clouds were touched and in their silent faces did he read unutterable love sound needed none nor any voice of joy his spirit drank the spectacle sensation soul and form all melted into him they swallowed up his animal being in them did he live and by them did he live they were his life can it be expected that either the author or his admirers should be induced to pay any serious attention to decisions which prove nothing but the pitiable state of the critic's own taste and sensibility on opening the review they see a favourite passage of the force and truth of which they had an intuitive certainty in their own inward experience confirmed if confirmation it could receive by the sympathy of their most enlightened friends 
some of whom perhaps even in the world's opinion hold a higher intellectual rank than the critic himself would presume to claim and this very passage they find selected as the characteristic effusion of a mind deserted by reason as furnishing evidence that the writer was raving or he could not have thus strung words together without sense or purpose no diversity of taste seems capable of explaining such a contrast in judgment that i had overrated the merit of a passage or poem that i had erred concerning the degree of its excellence i might be easily induced to believe or apprehend but that lines the sense of which i had analysed and found consonant with all the best convictions of my understanding and the imagery and diction of which had collected round those convictions my noblest as well as my most delightful feelings that i should admit such lines to be mere nonsense or lunacy is too much for the most ingenious arguments to effect but that such a revolution of taste should be brought about by a few broad assertions seems little less than impossible on the contrary it would require an effort of charity not to dismiss the criticism with the aphorism of the wise man in animam malevolam sapientia haud intrare potest what then if this very critic should have cited a large number of single lines and even of long paragraphs which he himself acknowledges to possess eminent and original beauty what if he himself has owned that beauties as great are scattered in abundance throughout the whole book and yet though under this impression should have commenced his critique in vulgar exultation with a prophecy meant to secure its own fulfilment with a this won't do what if after such acknowledgments extorted from his own judgment he should proceed from charge to charge of tameness and raving flights and flatness and at length consigning the author to the house of incurables should conclude with a strain of rudest contempt evidently grounded in the distempered state of his own moral associations suppose too all this done without a single leading principle established or even announced and without any one attempt at argumentative deduction though the poet had presented a more than usual opportunity for it by having previously made public his own principles of judgment in poetry and supported them by a connected train of reasoning the office and duty of the poet is to select the most dignified as well as the gayest happiest attitude of things the reverse for in all cases the reverse is possible is the appropriate business of burlesque and travesty a predominant taste for which has been always deemed a mark of a low and degraded mind when i was at rome among many other visits to the tomb of julius the second i went thither once with a prussian artist a man of genius and great vivacity of feeling as we were gazing on michelangelo's moses our conversation turned on the horns and beard of that stupendous statue of the necessity of each to support the other of the superhuman effect of the former and the necessity of the existence of both to give a harmony and integrity both to the image and the feeling excited by it conceive them removed and the statue would become unnatural without being supernatural we call to mind the horns of the rising sun and i repeated the noble passage from taylor's holy dying that horns were the emblem of power and sovereignty among the eastern nations and are still retained as such in abyssinia the achilloas of the ancient greeks and the probable ideas and feelings that originally suggested the mixture of the human and the brute form in the figure by which they realized the idea of their mysterious pan as representing intelligence blended with a darker power deeper mightier and more universal than the conscious intellect of man than intelligence all these thoughts and recollections passed in procession before our minds my companion who possessed more than his share of the hatred which his countrymen bore to the french had just observed to me a frenchman sir is the only animal in the human shape that by no possibility can lift itself up to religion or poetry when lo two french officers of distinction and rank enter the church mark you whispered the prussian the first thing which those scoundrels will notice for they will begin by instantly noticing the statue in parts without one moment's pause of admiration impressed by the whole will be the horns and the beard and the associations which they will immediately connect with them will be those of a he-goat and a cuckold never did man guess more luckily had he inherited a portion of the great legislator's prophetic powers whose statue we had been contemplating he could scarcely have uttered words more coincident with the result for even as he had said so it came to pass in the excursion the poet has introduced an old man born in humble but not abject circumstances who had enjoyed more than usual advantages of education both from books and from the more awful discipline of nature this person he represents as having been driven by the restlessness of fervid feelings and from a craving intellect to an itinerant life and as having in consequence passed the larger portion of his time from earliest manhood in villages and hamlets from door to door a vagrant merchant bent beneath his load now whether this be a character appropriate to a lofty didactic poem is perhaps questionable it presents a fair subject for controversy 
and the question is to be determined by the congruity or incongruity of such a character with what shall be proved to be the essential constituents of poetry but surely the critic who passing by all the opportunities which such a mode of life would present to such a man all the advantages of the liberty of nature of solitude and of solitary thought all the varieties of places and seasons through which his track had lain with all the varying imagery they bring with them and lastly all the observations of men their manners their enjoyments and pursuits their passions and their feelings which the memory of these yearly journeys must have given and recalled to such a mind the critic i say who from the multitude of possible associations should pass by all these in order to fix his attention exclusively on the pin-papers and stay-tapes which might have been among the wares of his pack this critic in my opinion cannot be thought to possess a much higher or much healthier state of moral feeling than the frenchman above recorded End of chapter 21